Welcome to our third Witness Wednesday. My name is Catherine McVeigh, and I'm the president of the Center for Effective Government. We gather here today, as we have for the last two Wednesdays, to listen to just some of the voices of the 3.2 million unemployed Americans who have been denied emergency long-term benefits since last Christmas. Next week is the 4th of July, Independence Day. And in honor of the men and women who fought and died for our freedom, we're going to listen to their stories. This week, we'll hear about the lives of almost 300,000 veterans of our armed services who have been unemployed and unsupported for over six months. They fought for us, and now it's time for us to fight for them. Like almost all the unemployed people who sent us their stories, veterans also tell us that they play by the rules. They took care of their families. They did what was asked for them, of them, even putting their lives on the line with call to service. But now, in their hour of need, we've turned our backs on them. This is unconscionable. This should not be happening in America. Refusing to allow a vote on assisting jobless Americans is unpatriotic. We can do better than this. We are better than this. We honor our veterans today by listening hard to their stories. We can demonstrate our gratitude for their service and their sacrifice by demanding that, we're, that we extend the emergency unemployment benefits to them and millions of other Americans who are watching their lives dissolve before their eyes because we refuse to help them. I'm pleased to start this off by introducing Representative David Cicely, who has been a real champion of extending unemployment benefits. Representative Thank you, Catherine. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank all of my colleagues who have joined us here, here to them in just a moment. I want to thank the Center for Effective Government and all of the veterans at this group that are here today for the work that they are doing to highlight how veterans are being severely harmed by Congress's failure to renew unemployment insurance. Uh, when unemployment insurance expired on December 28, 2013, just three days after Christmas, 130,000 unemployed veterans were left out in the cold. Today, nearly 300,000 veterans have exhausted their unemployment insurance, with nearly 7,000 more expected to be cut off from unemployment insurance every week that Congress fails to act. This situation will continue to get even more dire for those who have served our country and are now struggling to find work. Throughout the years, our nation's veterans have bravely stood watch keeping our country safe and protecting the liberties we cherish. We owe them a tremendous debt of gratitude, something that we can never fully repay. They selflessly protected our great nation. We have a responsibility to fulfill our promises and support them when they return home. Anything less is un-American and unacceptable. The Senate yesterday introduced a new bill to extend unemployment insurance. I believe the time has long passed for the House to overcome political differences and to act on this critical issue. Today, I sent a letter to House Majority Leader-elect Kevin McCarthy, or now House Majority Leader, requesting a meeting to discuss ways we can work together to advance a bill in the House that addresses the needs of millions of unemployed Americans, particularly to uphold the promises that we've made to our nation's real heroes. Our veterans didn't fail us. We can't fail them. We have to continue fighting to renew this critical safety net for our veterans who have sacrificed so much to protect our liberty, protect families, all jobless Americans. And that's why earlier this week, uh, this year rather, I launched the Faces of the Unemployed Project to bring the voices and faces of unemployed Rhode Islanders to the halls of the U.S. Capitol and to press my colleagues to push for a vote on this important issue. I'd like to end by sharing the story of Anthony from Providence, Rhode Island, who's an unemployed veteran and one of the many faces of the unemployed. He says, and I quote, I recently lost my apartment. I've not had income to even negotiate a stay. Keeping my phone on has been a struggle as well, as it's needed to apply for jobs and new job boards. Transportation to interviews has become leery, and I've had to pass on some jobs for reasons of not being able to afford public transportation. There's a crumbling feeling I'm having for the America I helped to fight for, work for, and pay taxes to. Please consider and pass the extension of unemployment insurance, if not for the ex Navy CV civilian carpenter, then for the owners facing foreclosure and job seekers depending on gas to get to interviews, or perhaps for growing the economy. 
That's just one story of the many, many veterans who are facing these very difficult moments because of our failures in our insurance. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Thomas. How are you? David, to you, thank you very much and for leading us in a letter to communicate to the new Republican Majority Leader, Mr. McCarthy, that we really want to see action. And certainly every veteran American deserves to have action. Three million, more than three million Americans today are waiting for Congress to act. What, what most Americans don't recognize is that of those more than three million Americans who are waiting for Congress to act to restore those emergency unemployment insurance benefits, 300,000 are American veterans. And this week, another 7,000 will be added to that number. And next week, another 7,000 veterans will run out of benefits. And, and next week, another 7,000. And so long as our colleagues on the Republican side refuse to let us have a vote, more and more Americans and more and more American veterans will lose their emergency unemployment insurance. At a time when this Congress, this House, is willing to have more than 50 votes to repeal a health security law that has given millions of Americans access to affordable health care, at a time when this House of Representatives was willing to vote on measures to give corporations and special interests hundreds of millions of dollars in tax breaks, we can't get a vote to give over 300,000 Americans who are veterans a chance to have their emergency unemployment insurance. We know we can do it. We're just asking for a vote. We're not asking for every one of our colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle to vote with us. We'd just like them to give us a vote. Let those who serve this country, whether in uniform in Iraq or Afghanistan, or whether in uniform as a police officer, a firefighter, a technician, an office clerk, everyone who has served to make America, make America better, let them have a vote to have their emergency unemployment insurance restored. And let Tammy from Los Angeles, California, have a vote. She says, I am 49 years old and I have been working since I was 16. I want to work and I am far from lazy. I love my country. I served in the United States Navy. I lost my job as a technician after being with the same company for over 23 years. I received unemployment benefits for about four months and was able to pay my mortgage and car note. Since the extensions were stopped, I lost my car and have moved several family members in to help with the mortgage. I have diligently searched for work and continue to search for work of any kind. Please reinstate the extension program and give us working Americans the help we need. Vietnam veteran, and I'm thinking back to the 45 years or so ago when I was getting out of the service and transi transitioning into civilian life, it was much easier. We had the people at the hospital who were helping me, the people at the Veterans Administration who were helping me, and the people at the colleges who were helping me, and they just had everything laid out in the path, and all I had to do was to play the few forms, and I was good to go. So I ask that um, we remember the 1% of America who was doing anything with the war on terror. Only 1% of our citizens are involved directly in the war on terror, and they're the ones we need to help. Let me tell you a little bit about Gary from uh, Covers Cove, Texas. He says, I haven't had any unemployment assistance or any financial assistance of the sort since December of 2013. It is currently June of 2014. I can barely afford my rent and having any type of transportation. I walk everywhere in the form of a car or public transportation is too expensive for me. 
I am currently enrolled in college and I am a veteran of the United States Army. While the education may help, at the rate I have been applying for jobs, hundreds of applications a month, I do not think the outlook is good. I spent six years in the United States Army as an infantryman, and though I served with pride and loved every moment I had, there is nothing for me out there jobways, and without some financial assistance, I fear the situation may become much worse for me. The long-term outlook is not good. I have spent all my savings, and up until a month ago, I did not even have my own place to live. When I left the Army, I was upbeat in my outlook. My, the last time I had a civilian job was in 2006. I was unaware how job, bad the job market is. I did not worry about my, my employment prospects at that time. I am not a drug addict. I am not a gambler. I am not lazy. I walk over 10 miles to and from school each day. I am not slacking. I have a recorded log of the pile of job applications I have filled out and had rejected or not answered, and I am not happy about this situation. I fought for this country, had, has have many of my other brothers and sisters in arms. All I want is a chance to survive financially and I, until I can be employed once again. There, there are a lot of other folks like Gary out there, and he's lucky. He does not have a family to support. He's only looking out for himself. Can you imagine how much worse it is for those who have wives and children who depend on the income that's been taken away since they haven't been able to get employment? I urge you to help all these veterans. After all, they are the ones who answered the call when our country said, we need, we need your help. We thank you for your attention today. Thank you. Representative Crowley. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I have a, a story from John of, from New York City. And he says, I'm fearful that I'm going to lose my house. My money has run out, all of my savings. I will not have the money for utilities or food very shortly. I have worked and paid my taxes for more than 45 years. Never before have I had to accept unemployment. I was injured on the job. After surgery, I was told that my career of 33 years was over. I would have to learn to do something else. I'm 57 years old and have been hitting a brick wall of rejection. I am a veteran and have been a hardworking man all of my life. I need help. Let me repeat that. I am a veteran and have been a hardworking man all of my life. I need help. John needs help. And so do hundreds of thousands of other Americans and hundreds of thousands of veterans who, through no fault of their own, find themselves jobless in this market today. Now, I can understand that to my Republican colleagues that this is not an emergency for them. This is not an emergency for them. They have employment. But for the people who are suffering right now, who will have to make life decisions. This is the ultimate emergency for them. They never saw this coming, and yet they are living in a world of constant emergency. Talk about being out of touch. Out of touch with the average struggling American. And that is what the Republican leadership and the Republican caucus is today. Their conference is out of touch, not only what these hundreds of thousands of suffering Americans, but of all America, when especially they neglect to take care of those who would defend the freedoms, who would defend these structures, who would defend this edifice in which they work today in representing their constituency. That is the epitome of out of touch with America. Now turn to J. David Cox, the American Federation of Governmental Employees. Thank you very much, Congressman. And, and brothers and sisters, we're here today, and we're here saying, let democracy ring in this country. Let the Congress of the United States of America hold votes, vote them up, vote them down, but hold votes on the legislation that's very important for the American people. 
When I think of the men and women that I've cared for as I worked in the Department of Veterans Affairs for many, many years, World War I, World War II veterans, Vietnam veterans, they all took with great pride that they served this country. They defended this country. They created a democracy, a democracy where votes occur, where they occur, and again, democracy prevails. When we don't have votes, we can't let democracy take its course in this country. So today, you know, I am glad to give witness to the fact that there are uh, high numbers of unemployed veterans in this country. The unemployment rate of veterans is higher than in the non-veteran population. Over 9% of veterans are unemployed. And I'd also say today, the Congress of the United States needs to fully fund the Department of Veterans Affairs to care for the men and women that have defended this democracy over and over again and who have cared for us, we have a responsibility and that it is immoral, immoral that a man or woman who has served this country faithfully and that their unemployment benefits are expiring and they are trying so hard to get a job and they can't find a job. And there are those that would say, well, unemployment rates are down. They're only down, brothers and sisters, because people have finally just quit looking because they're giving up hope. And that should never happen in a country this great because democracy, again, should allow votes to occur in the United States Congress. That's how we should be. And today, I've got a letter that I want to read. And you may think unemployment, oh, that's just the uneducated, the poor, those folks that, you know, they just can't find a job. Today, I'm reading a letter from Mark Stevens from Beaverton, Oregon. Mark is 58 years old with a bachelor's degree and lost his job in September 2013 to a reduction in force. My extended unemployment benefits ended May 6th. I have since sold everything of value that I own just to make due. My rent is coming due on June 1st. I won't be able to make it. I'm going to be out on the street. I am a veteran with a college education. I am dependable, reliable, honest, hard-working person who takes pride in the work that I do. Unfortunately, the United States House of Representatives could care less about those values. And I'm going to kind of edit Mark's comments there. Some members of the United States House of Representatives could care less. There are those who do. And while I try to manage my own uh, way through the challenge of our recovering economy and the values of our corporate leaders, I guess at 58, I was naive to think that we're all in this together. Boy, was I daydreaming. We spent trillions of dollars on bailing out banks and providing Wall Street bonuses for those who created this challenging economy. But for a highly skilled worker, a veteran with a family. This country has nothing. Come June 5th, I will be on the street corner panhandling to survive. What is this country coming to and what is this country about? Is this why our military service personnel risk their lives to save and protect the freedoms of our country and this land? When we need help, there isn't enough. Please do all that you can to compel Speaker Boehner to bring up for a vote the bill to extend unemployment benefits. Lives are at stake. And brothers and sisters, I challenge each one of us today to not quit, to not stop, and to do everything in our power with every breath that we have in our body until democracy prevails in this country and the United States Congress is allowed to vote on unemployment benefits and extension of them for the men and women who serve this country so faithfully. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters. I'd now like to invite up my colleague Jan Schakowsky, who's been a great champion of 
extending unemployment benefits and so many other important issues. Thank you. I am Jan Schakowsky of the 9th District of Illinois. I'm so honored to be now at the third Witness Wednesday. I want to thank all the people who put it together. And I want to uh, acknowledge these numbers that just keep changing every few minutes to say that more and more people are uh, losing their unemployment insurance benefits and 300, oh, 285,000 veterans by the end of this month. Last night, I was at the Marine Sunset Parade at Arlington National Cemetery. It was an opportunity for me because they were honoring women of the of the Congress. There were seven of us representing the, the women there last night. And I have to tell you, when you saw the flag waving on this beautiful night last night and you heard Tab playing, there isn't a person there that didn't feel patriotic, that didn't have a tear in their eye. But how do we really express that? It's an opportunity right now to reflect how much our brave men and women who have sacrificed so much for our country are appreciated. And here's the story from my district, from Terrence in Chicago, who said, I was a full-time student at Kennedy King College in Chicago in the fall of 2013. The last day of class was December 17, 2013. When school was out, as a veteran, I could not receive funds for attending school. So extended unemployment benefits would have allowed me to keep my apartment until the spring semester began. My unemployment ran out on December 28, 2013. Since those benefits ended, I had to give up my apartment, give up my apartment, give everything away. And he says, I didn't have time to sell anything and move out of town. So I missed school for spring. I am now living with friends in Michigan. This is a veteran. Terrence should not have to live like this. The House leadership should listen to his story, the story of all those who are uh, unemployed, including our benef benefits, and should give us a vote. Thank you. And now we have Representative Kildee. Thank you. I'm going to start with the story from Byron from Spring Lake, Michigan. He says, I'm a 50-year-old former Marine. I have worked my whole life never needing anything from the government. For the first time, I've had to apply for food stamps. I've been evicted from my apartment, and I'm now living in a tent on my friend's property. My car insurance and plates are expired so I'm driving illegally trying to find work without this unemployment extension. I am a Marine that has worked since I was 12 years old. I am not lazy, nor do I want anything special from our government. But without this extended unemployment, I truly don't know what I will do tomorrow. I don't know what I'll do tomorrow. Tomorrow, the House of Representatives could take up a bill to extend emergency unemployment benefits. It is fully within our power to act. Many of the issues that we take on in this country are really complex questions that have you know, incredible complexity to them. This is one that's really simple. Three million people, 300,000 people who put on, a, uh, on the uniform of this country stand to lose everything that they've worked for, for one reason and one reason only. The Republican leadership in the House of Representatives refuses to bring up a bill that they know would pass. What shame that brings on our democracy. That's a shame. We need to take up emergency and uh, unemployment and extension now, not just for Byron, but for the three million people who stand to lose everything that they've worked for. Thank you. Representative uh, Dina Titus. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much. I want to thank my colleagues and the advocates who are with us again on this Witness Wednesday and thank all of you for coming to help us spread these stories because we know the stories, we hear them all the time, but we want the rest of the country to hear them as well and we want it to be loud and clear so the Republicans across the aisle will hear the stories and perhaps have some compassion for these folks we're talking about. You know, last uh, Wednesday we talked about the stories of women and their children who are uh, suffering with unemployment and can't get their benefits, lost their home, lost their car, lost their husband. Today the stories of our veterans are just as compelling. My office is located in downtown Las Vegas. Across one street you have uh, Veterans Village. Down the way you have U.S. Vets. They do great work. They send veterans to our office. We try to help. But that's on a one-to-one -one basis. It may change one life, but we could do so much more. We could pass unemployment insurance extension to help people all across the country, not just the handful that are within easy reach of my office. I'd like to share with you the story of Daryl from Las Vegas. His story is very similar to the others that you have heard, but it can't help but pull at your heartstrings when you hear that a person who has worn the uniform made the sacrifice that the these soldiers have made, men and women, many different wars, many different times, many different circumstances to come back and find the country turning its back on them once again. This is what Daryl has to say. I served my country in the U.S. Navy admirably for seven of the greatest years of my life. I went on to obtain an associate degree, raised up four kids as a single parent, and coached for many years, being a mentor to children. We are the best nation on earth, and I believe that. I believed it then. I have spent many days and long nights, though, trying to figure out how I can keep a roof over my head. I learned how to build a website and built an online store. Learning on my own, I kept praying that I could generate enough income so I can live with a roof over my head. I lost my job to no fault of my own in July of last year, and I was receiving unemployment until Congress elected not to extend unemployment benefits right at Christmas, which I might add was a terrible time to be cut off. Since then, like others, I have been going through many hardships. Being that I reside in Las Vegas, Nevada, the employment rate, unemployment he meant to say, rate is higher than the national average. And at 53 years of age, it seems as if I'm getting passed over time and again. Now I have exhausted all of my funds, used up all the help that was given to me from resources, friends, and family. We are just praying this will soon be over as time passes us by. I haven't paid my rent this month, and of course gas and electric and other bills are due. Even worse, I have no gas to get to an interview even if I got one to find a job. I know my story isn't different from many Americans out there, which is the shame of it. You are right, Daryl. We hear you. It is a shame. Bring this up for a vote. I want to explain to you that we're um, changing the, the order a little bit because there's a vote that's going on now. So we're going to get, go all the way through the representatives, the members, and then um, with our rest, rest of our guests, okay? So our next one is um, Representative, Representative Paul, Paul Tonko from California. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I'm Paul Tonko, and I have the uh, great opportunity to serve the 20th Congressional District of New York and humbled by the many stories that I hear day in and day out. Since late last year, more than 237,000 New Yorkers have gone without the lifelines they require. A lifeline cut by the cold and crew unwillingness of the Republican majority in the House of Representatives to extend the emergency unemployment insurance compensation and extended benefits. It is heartless that they do this. And I would ask all of us to absorb in this given moment and this Witness Wednesday the stark contrast that exists in the House, a majority that will rush to the floor to move to extend tax cuts above an average of $200,000 for millionaires and billionaires, tax cuts for millionaires and billionaires, and they can't rush to the floor to extend unemployment insurance benefits for working women and men 
who have paid into that insurance program. I was asked the other day in a high school classroom, what are the attributes a representative needs? First and foremost, I said you have to be a good listener. Are they listening? Are they listening? They're not listening. And people have gone without. Back in January, I met with two of the 237,000 New Yorkers who have gone without the unemployment insurance benefit. They talked about how they lost their jobs. Two women who lost their jobs through no fault of their own were on a professional career track and found themselves in deep trouble. They were looking and continue to look for employment so as to provide for their families and to move forward with their careers and with their lives. And I am really moved by their concern here. And we need to empathize. That is the House of Representatives at its best. This is not a program that is a handout. This is a program that has been earned. It is a critical safety net for far too many millions across this nation that are looking for jobs and want the assistance that they need. It's very essential. Every single day I hear from Americans, as my colleagues do, on the urgent need to restore this lifetime, lifeline to 3.1 million Americans. Let me read a, a letter that has come to my attention from a constituent on this Witness Wednesday. Dear Representative Tonko, I am 45 years old. I have a bachelor's degree in government and a master's degree in education. I have been part of the workforce since the day I turned 16, even earlier if my babysitting chores counted. I was the first person in my immediate family to go to college. I have worked hard and my career has been varied. I taught social studies, worked for nonprofits, and finally ended up with a career in sales. The economy eventually led to my layoff from my last two positions. I have suffered through two 14-month periods of unemployment. And as a result, I've accumulated over $35,000 in credit card debt. I had to go on food stamps, which was an extremely humbling experience for me. I made sure to go to supermarkets where no one would know me because I was so embarrassed. Most recently, I had to give up my apartment and move back with my mom and stepdad after living on my own for the last 23 years. I'm working with three staffing agencies, have applied to more jobs than I can count, networked with people in my field as well as contacted former college friends in search of any leads. So far, I have received two two-day assignments for $11 an hour. My unemployment ran out a few weeks ago and I have no savings, 401k or stock. So now, instead of being able to save some money while I'm looking for full-time employment, I'm scraping just to pay the bills I still have. I currently have $50 in my bank account. I feel trapped, hopeless, and useless. The depression gets the best of me sometimes, but I do continue to focus on the future. I'm not looking for sympathy or charity, but I would like to give Congress a reality check to show them what it means to real people when they cut off unemployment benefits because of political reasons. I am an intelligent and hardworking person. I still have a lot to contribute to this country, but it sickens me that I live in a country that sees me as someone who is lazy and would rather collect unemployment instead of being a contributing member of society. Therefore, I ask you to please, please tell your colleagues, are you listening to stop the politics and start governing for all of the citizens of the United States of America? Best regards, Melissa. That strikes home. They need to listen. They can spout all the words, freedom, opportunity, work. Show it to us like you mean it. Show it to us like you mean it. Let's bring the bill to the floor. Let's give the unemployment insurance issue the, the respect that the people who have paid into the system deserve. Thank you very much. I introduce Representative Steve Horsford, while a freshman, an eloquent voice of the Democratic caucus in our house, a Democrat from Nevada. Good afternoon. 3.1 million Americans, 300,000 veterans, and in my home state of Nevada, 33,000 Nevadans who have lost their unemployment insurance since December 28th because of the failure of Speaker Boehner and House Republicans to simply give us a vote to extend unemployment insurance benefits. I'm here to share the story of Addison, a constituent of Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm surfing without power. I can't pay for my phone 
or for insurance on my vehicle. I'm 62 and I'm trying to find work on foot. To all representatives in Washington, D.C., put yourself in my shoes. If you can, imagine the humiliation that I feel. I served this country in Vietnam, and I have paid taxes for 45 years. And this is the appreciation that I get? I don't understand. This is just crazy. Well, for Addison, she's right. It's just crazy that Speaker Boehner and the House Republicans won't give us a vote to extend unemployment insurance benefits. But for Addison, the 3.1 million Americans, the 300,000 veterans, and the other Nevadans who are looking for help, know that we have not forgotten you. We are standing here and will continue to fight on your behalf because you're worth it, you deserve it, and your voice matters too. Thank you. members because they're voting. I want to make that point. These are good champions. They're working hard to make sure that unemployment is extended. I want to introduce now Michael Weiss, who is a Vietnam vet. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Weiss. I'm a U.S. Army Vietnam veteran, a member of the American Legion, the Veterans of Foreign War, the Vietnam Veterans of America, and a retired executive of Catholic Relief Services. Uh, during my 37 years with that American charitable organization, I saw the great goodness of the American people expressed, not only through private voluntary organizations, but also through government programs in times of major emergencies, wars, and pandemics. These programs were supported by Republicans and Democrats alike. How then can we do less for our own hardworking citizens, especially those patriots who answered our nation's call to serve in the military in defense of our freedoms? I will now read a letter from Narlinda of Portland, Oregon, that highlights our failure to adequately care for our returning veterans as they struggle to reintegrate into the ailing American economy. My name is Narlinda. I am a mother of three. My eldest is autistic, and my youngest is partially deaf. My hu husband is a 10-year dual branch veteran of the Army and the Marine Corps. Last March, when he got out of the service, we were told he could re-enlist in the Army. So we packed our belongings into a storage unit and knowing we wouldn't be in our home state for his service, we traveled and visited family who we had not seen in years and who our children had never met. After two weeks, we were told that we would have to wait almost three months for him to re-enlist. By this time, our savings were almost gone. He looked for work, but quickly found out there was none in our area. So we traveled through four states looking for work. During this time, we slept in our car and went lucky at a campground or in family yards in tents. Once the wait came, we were told he could no longer re-enlist due to him being out of his military occupational specialty, his MOS, for, two, for more than 36 months. After contacting multiple recruiters, we found no one who knew what to do. By this time, our savings was gone. We had been living in a tent and could not afford to rent anywhere. In August, someone reported our family for being homeless, and we were told that we had to have a home by the time school starts or they would take our children because we could not offer a stable environment. Luckily, a family member loaned us an RV and we found a, a, a site to stay in. In December, we were notified his MOS, Military Occupational Specialty, was no longer open. Thousands of job applications, thousands of job applications later, he still had no job. Then we found out his emergency 
employment, unemployment insurance was getting cut. So I started a Facebook page. The intent was to use it for people to post what, what they needed help with uh, and for others to come offer help. And I called it the empowering people with a voice. I myself am disabled with a very rare disease as well as many others. However, by ensuring my husband and everyone else can attain employment, I feel like I am doing my part to help ensure my children's future. My husband is currently enrolled in intelligence studies through AMU, hoping that he will either make himself more appealing to the military or at least get a job that will tie in with his dreams of serving this nation and its people. I have actually spent my life volunteering in many ways. However, now I concentrate all of my time helping the unemployed and the underemployed. I will continue to stand up for the unemployed and the underemployed until every person in this country has a chance at their inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I hope both the Democrats and the Republicans Congress in Congress will stand up with us, we the people, to employ America and to restore the American dream. We hear you, Narlinda. We stand with you and with your husband. God bless you. Reverend Kelly Wilkins from the Coalition on Human Needs. Hello, my name is Reverend Kelly Wilkins. I'm with the Coalition on Human Needs. And we are an alliance of organizations, nonprofits, service organizations, local, regional, and state and national organizations working together to promote public policies which address the needs of low income and vulnerable families. And if I just may add, I not only serve as a minister local here in DC, but I also serve as a chaplain in the US Army National Guard. So this issue is important to the people that I'm called to serve. I'm going to read the story today of Mark, and he is from St. Cloud, Florida. I lost my place to live, so I stayed with my daughter for a couple of months. Then my brother took me in and I moved out in California. I couldn't find any gainful employment with benefits, therefore, I moved to be, uh, to be close to my son, thinking there would be work upstate New York. I've been here a month, and most of the jobs are very low pay and part-time, and I have very little of my savings left. I am educated, 59 years old, and what I'm, what I'm finding is this. I'm way overeducated for most positions, but I don't have enough training and experience for other positions. I'm all through my 401k. The emergency unemployment stopped, and now I eat TV dinners and health bars. I have enough money for maybe two months, and then I'll be in the streets. I played by the rules. I got my college education and I am honorably discharged veteran. He said, I played by the rules. If you are spending the money that was taken from US taxpayers, how about a little relief for those of us that have been in the workforce for decades? This is the story of Mark, a St. Cloud, Florida. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Owens, the executive director of the National Employment Law Project. Thank you, Catherine. My name is Chris Owens, and I'm with the National Employment Law Project. I'm reading a story from Alicia from Georgia. 
Georgia has cut its unemployment benefits to a maximum of 18 weeks, even though the state's unemployment rate is still above 7 percent. Alicia writes, I am one of the 300,000 veterans that are unemployed. I am a Persian Gulf veteran. I am also a nurse and was laid off due to no fault of my own in September 2013. My unemployment insurance expired in January 2014. I took advantage of the VRAP program, but it too has expired. I am unable to drive to the Department of Labor or to school because my funds are gone and it's getting too hard to come up with gas money. After this month, I am not sure how I will pay my cell phone bills, so the applications I am submitting will be in vain because I will not be able to receive phone calls for an interview. To see veterans suffer with all that we have done for our country is a betrayal. Congress has betrayed the veterans and the American people by not voting on the UI extension. Congress should not quote the Pledge of the Allegiance to the flag anymore because we are no longer one nation under God, indivisible with justice for all. And Dr. Roberta Downing from the American Psychological Association. I am here today because as a social psychologist and also as a working mother, I'm worried about the millions of people around the country who've lost their jobs in this tough economy, who've run out of income because they've been cut off of unemployment insurance, and who are at risk of falling into poverty, hunger, and homelessness. I'm also worried about the psychological impact of this situation, not only on the unemployed people, but also on their children, their families, and whole communities. I'm here to read a story from Carlisle of Bentonville, Arkansas. Carlisle says, I've been living on whatever I have left to sell. I lost my vehicle to repossession and I will be losing my apartment this month. I have nothing left to sell in the thought that our Congress, the people voted into office, have turned their backs on us makes my blood boil. I am a veteran of the armed forces and I have two degrees. I have an AAS in CAD design and a Bachelor's of Science in Business Management that I earned in 2009. The congressmen that have actively blocked the emergency unemployment benefits should lose their incomes with no chance for rehire. Then they can look at their children or family members and tell them, no, I can't. There is nothing worse than telling a loved one, I have no income and I can't help you. We hear you, Carlisle. We stand with you. Thank you. And we'll end with Rabbi Jessica Kirshner. I'm Rabbi Jessica Kirshner. I represent the Central Conference of American Rabbis and the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism. I'm here today because the Israelites cried out their bitterness and the indignity of slavery, and God heard them and sent Moses to liberate them. Today, we, the inheritors of this sacred story, hear the cries of men and women trapped degraded and dispirited by lack of employment. Those who hear their stories cannot help but be moved, and all people of faith should be standing with them, ready to move mountains and to part seas to restore their dignity. God's hands at work in our world. I'm here to read Stephen's story from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I am a single father of seven children. My oldest two daughters are my natural daughters, and the other five came by way of my daughter's mother's passing in July of 2012. I lost my job because I lacked the daycare assistance to cover my job on a consistent basis. I had to withdraw state unemployment shortly thereafter, while in the meantime looking for a job and trying to look for affordable daycare. I had to apply for state assistance for my first time ever having seven children to raise and no custodial rights to the other five, I was granted no assistance from the state. So I had to rely solely on my state unemployment along with the food bank to feed everyone. Needless to say, I was cut off a month into my emergency unemployment benefits and I lost my housing while well, all the children had to go live with school friends. They are devastated to have lost their mother and now they have lost each other. I'm a veteran of the U.S. Army, and if not for their support, we would all have been homeless by now. Many people are struggling, and more children are affected than you know. We hear you, Stephen, and we stand with you. 
So that concludes our, our Witness Wednesday for today. We'll be back on July 9th here at 1230 to stand up and stand for the unemployed. Be with us. Thank you.